You've just heard music from Daleville Christian Church's Vacation Bible School. And we make it a part of our portion of the worship that is from God's Word. And we were teaching in Vacation Bible School verses of God's Word, focusing particularly on those verses that have to do with light. And this one from 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. Indeed. The reading of God's word for today is from Matthew's gospel in the ninth chapter, the 35th through the 38th verses. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. I saw a column in the newspaper that is printed regularly. I read the newspaper because I'm an old person. The columnist is a pastor, so I usually try to follow where he's going on his chosen subject. I was able to follow his latest column just fine, but I thought there was something missing. I thought that something important was missing. His column was on a Christian lifestyle. Now, before I decided to trot this pastor's column out and start criticizing it, I went to his website to read some similar articles. He had one last March that I thought was much better than the one I read last week on the same topic of Christian lifestyle. So what was my complaint about the pastor's column of Christian lifestyle last week? My complaint is that the word love only showed up once in the entire column. The pastor mentioned profanity and anger and contempt and arrogance as not being a part of the Christian lifestyle. The pastor mentioned infidelity in marriage, adultery, and faithless sexual relationships as not a part of the Christian lifestyle. It seemed to me that it would be easy to say that all of the life choices he mentioned, all of them are offenses against love. You know, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the one you often hear Quoted at weddings, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. How can you talk about a Christian lifestyle and not talk all about love? To mention it only once? Love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, and not only is love a fruit of the Spirit, but love is listed first by the Apostle as a fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus said that by their fruits you will know them, my disciples. So imagine my disappointment and my depression when I read about clergy abusing children, young people, sexually assaulting people in their congregations, I'm still reading about New Life Christian Church and World Outreach not only have four women come forward as victims of abuse, one was abused as the wife of the pastor's son. 
The same son abused others in the church and the senior pastor knew about it. And that's not the worst? No. After the senior pastor made his so-called confession to the congregation, which was not the truth, he didn't have an affair. He sexually abused and assaulted a teenage girl repeatedly. After that truth was announced, members of the church circled around the senior pastor to pray for him. But they didn't circle around the victim who was standing there and pray for her. What is wrong with you so-called Christians? Those are just the Christians of that congregation. More than one of these women had gone to the authorities. Reports were filed. When and while the assaults were happening. And nothing was done. Now state authorities are looking into this dereliction of duty on the part of local authorities. And it would be best not to get me started about so-called Christians and their behavior during the worst of the pandemic in the last two years. The words about Jesus in today's Bible reading, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And what was Jesus doing about his compassion. Matthew told us, verse 35, went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease, every infirmity. And what did Jesus send the disciples to do? Matthew chapter 10, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every infirmity. Continuing chapter 10, these 12 Jesus sent out charging them, go rather to the lost sheep. Preach as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pay, give without pay. You receive. Pay it forward. Go to those who cannot pay. Go to those who cannot return a favor. Our Lord Jesus asks, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Our God is the God of the fatherless. So where are this God's worshipers? Will they not have compassion on the fatherless? Will they not have compassion on those sheep who have no shepherd, whose shepherds themselves have gone astray, abusing their own church members? The word compassion does not occur that often in the gospel. There are just a few descriptions of Jesus demonstrating and showing compassion three times in Matthew's gospel. All describe Jesus as having compassion. Twice also, Jesus is described as having compassion in Mark's gospel book. In Luke's book, his gospel, Jesus is described as having compassion just once. But Jesus used the word compassion to describe two characters in Jesus' story. The one about the Samaritan. He had compassion on the man he found at the side of the road. And the father with two sons had compassion. Jesus never commanded us to have compassion. I can be honest about that. Jesus never commanded us to have compassion. Jesus did show us compassion, and Jesus showed us what compassion looks like. 
Jesus did not command us to have passion. You can't really command that. Compassion literally means to suffer with someone. My wife Deborah recently read me an article from a professional therapist who worked with families whose loved ones needed therapy at home. But once that woman's own husband was injured, and she was the caregiver for her husband, she realized that her instructions to families probably didn't go very far because she didn't know the burden of caregiving for a loved one at home. Now she does. Now she could have compassion because she had suffered what the families she counseled have suffered. Her help with families would now come with compassion. You can't command that. Jesus knew that. But Jesus did command us to love. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John, Gospel, chapter 13. Jesus said it about four times in John's Gospel book. To increase our love for others is in almost all of the letters of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Jesus saw the command to love as one of the greatest commandments, to love your neighbor. And then Jesus showed us how to love others. Jesus even said, love one another as I have loved you. In all the arguments, all the disagreements, all the protests and disagreements of Christians with other people in these modern times, I almost always see love missing from the discussion. During the pandemic, I didn't hear about churches wondering or wrestling on how best to love other people. I heard about protests and civil disobedience. I heard plenty of anger, but I didn't hear much about love. And for all the shouting from some pastors, I didn't learn anything about how to love. It's a commandment of Jesus. Instead of pastors saying, well, I don't care about the virus. And that pastor died from COVID-19. I would have wanted to hear pastors saying, how can I love people during this virus until it passes? I would have you notice in our Bible reading today from Matthew chapter 10 that Matthew records for us Jesus' own words to the disciples. Why? There's a simple reason for that. Matthew records Jesus' own words to the disciples because Matthew is not writing a history book. Matthew is writing a gospel book on Jesus' message and Jesus' message to all followers of Jesus. And the message to all followers of Jesus is go to the lost. Help heal people. Help people to see. These are not just instructions for 12 of Jesus' followers. These instructions come from the master himself for all of Jesus' followers. Then I read some really strange statistics from people whose business is to compile statistics. Statistics on American Christians. 56% of Christians feel their spiritual life is entirely private. 56% of American Christians feel that their Christian spiritual life is entirely private. It's going to be a little difficult to fulfill one of the great commandments if your spiritual life is entirely private. How are you going to love your neighbor or love your enemy, which Jesus also tells us to do? How are you going to do that privately? I guess that old joke is true. When the pastor asked the man at church, sir, are you in the Lord's army? And the man said, yes, I am. And the pastor said, sir, I've only seen you here in worship twice this year. 
And the churchgoer said, well, I'm in the secret service. It must be true. Apparently, for over half of American Christians, they are secret Christians only. But friends, you don't have to explain the Trinity, whether you believe it or not. You don't have to explain it to someone to live your faith. But you might have to ask to pray for someone. You might have to ask if you can pray with someone. It's not rocket science. There was no rocket science in Jesus' day. Now we have rocket science, and living the Christian faith is not rocket science. Loving our neighbors is not rocket science. As followers of Jesus, we are supposed to be good at loving other people. Jesus' instructions to the disciples, you receive, give, pay it forward. Go to those who cannot pay. Go to those who cannot return a favor. Help them. If they are sick, figure out how to help with the healing. If they're lonely, visit them. If they're unfairly judged, talk with them. If they're hungry, feed them. That majority of American Christians in Jesus' secret service, the numbers are even worse than the pollsters tell us. They don't think growing in faith is important. That their faith isn't all that important in their life. And they often don't have time for the Lord every week. These people call themselves Christians. Friends, relationships take at least two. And our Lord is always ready for more relationships with you, with me, with all of us. The Word of God says in more than one place, seek the Lord. The Word of God says, know the Lord. We've been talking for weeks about how God's Word has a real concern for those who are losing faith, and it didn't happen overnight. It seems to me that those who serve in Jesus' secret service are moving toward the exit door of faith. When I look at those who claim Jesus and later renounce Jesus, I notice a lack of relationship in what they say. Those who lost faith didn't talk much about the love of God or God's love for them. The greatest commandment, love God. Love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Don't stop with one out of three. Keep going. I read one man's claim that once he understood the love that God had for him, it didn't matter about all the bad things that had happened to him in his life. The love of God had made it all worth it. Love God and your neighbor. For surely God loves you and your neighbor, in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord.